this all over again. Sounds How about good. <laughs> I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my safety. He tells me everything on him to roll. He's a very strong valley.
Jesus from remain. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. All right, you may be seated for a moment. Go ahead and turn to page 257. But again, I, I just want to read a few announcements. We've heard them all before. I'm not put anything new in here. The potluck is uh, November 22nd. That is this coming Sunday. Uh, we will not have an, an evening service on potluck Sunday. We do not. And so um, just be sure to uh, bring a dish to share. Am I not right? 24. Let me look right here. This is the 20th. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there's no, there's no 30 first. first. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm double booking. <laughs> <laughs> we have the afternoon off. Catch up. All right, and then we have the Christmas Fellowship on December 7th at 1 p.m. at our house. Um, bring a, a favorite Christmas finger food. Um, don't worry about, uh, you know, making big roast or, or whatever, you know, big things. Just bring enough. For you and a couple others, and, or whoever you're with and a couple others, and, and we'll be good. Um, if you'd like to participate in the gift exchange game, gift exchange game, I guess that's the GEG. Uh, bring a gift under $10. Um, some of us don't like gifts, so we won't be participating, but don't let us be the Scrooges for you. If you enjoy that, just please go ahead and do that. I will assume the Secret Service Sisters know to fill out their Secret Service form if they want to apply and give them in secretly to Vera as soon as possible. Right? It won't go away, will it? <laughs> Brother, I found in ministry when I make a mistake, it lives on and on and on. We kind of like it. Yeah. It, it, actually, it actually is. It was pretty good. Yeah. So that's why I get so much mileage out of it. So anyway, I think that's it with uh, the form for you ladies. Looks like this. Printed on both sides. Okay. I'm not mocking you. I'm using that great uh, mistake you made. It was really good. But anyway. And we'll hand them in to <clears throat> Yeah, well, you're supposed to. Don't hand them to me. Um, also, uh, on decent, yeah, it's not going to go very far to get it to me. Uh, Sometimes people give me a piece of paper here and they don't make it home. <laughs> I have these magically disappearing pockets. You stick them in and things just disappear. So anyway, uh, December 22nd, the plan is for having a candlelight service after uh, our, uh, um, after there will be an evening service, it will be candlelight, and we will not have a service on the 25th of December. All right. So that's, a, that's the last one there. So 257, please. 257. I'm sorry if my mind's not thinking correctly. I got a lot of things on it right now, and they seem to be coming all together. So 257, once you get that, if you'll please stand. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. <clears throat> Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the same Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I Oh. 
to the book of Colossians. We were going through um, uh, verse 5, and, and actually now we're into verse 6, toward the end of verse 6 really. I don't know why I said 5. Um, so it's chapter 3, uh, and we're now at the end of verse 6, and I'll just... I had a few things left I wanted to talk about. I think I mentioned that in 5 through 11 of this chapter, uh, we're talking about uh, the principle that, that Paul has, has, has brought forth, is being expounded and explained. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about that tonight, uh, in my mind, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way, if, if you look at it a different way, that's fine, but the greatest Christian exercise... I think, and I say exercise for a reason, is is really the renouncing of the flesh. Now, this is something that is never over with. We we are constantly having to renounce uh, and, and try to step away from all sim, uh, sinful propensities in our life, from all sinful pursuits, because as we do this, as we step away from those things, as we exercise that separation that God wants us to exercise, what happens is we then allow, or maybe it would be proper to say encourage the Spirit of God to work in our lives um, and to allow that new growth to begin and to, to eventually produce a, 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 a fruit, a, a holy life. If, uh, if you're not trying to exercise your way to a righteous life, if you're not trying to exercise and, 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 and separate yourself from these sinful uh, propensities, the thoughts, the actions, the, the words, whatever it is uh, that is sin before God in your life, then you're never going to have a holy life. You're never going to have a right relationship with God. Um, uh, as I look at this, uh, there seems to be, for me, a reminder um, that Paul is bringing forth um, he's, I, let me go back and just read uh, in, in chapter 3 he says if ye then be risen with Christ so to me that's like a premise he's setting forth this if this is a fact seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God uh, set your affection on things above not on things of the earth For in, in, he's telling you that if you are really in Christ uh, these things are you commanded to do and again, when we talk about commands, these are things that you should do, but you, you're not forced to do, but you should be doing them. So he commands you, so you have a choice in this. And then he says, for ye are dead. Well, this is not a command, this is a statement of fact. Are you dead in Christ or not? If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you are dead in him. You say, well, I don't feel like it. Well, it's not based on feelings. It's based on the fact of the word of God. And so he goes on to say, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. This again is a fact. It's not a feeling. It's a fact. And then he goes on to four. With Christ who is our life. Again. This is factual. 
shall appear. He will appear one day. It's a future event. Shall appear. There's some time in the future he's going to appear. Then shall ye. So you will also uh, appear with him in glory. All these are facts. So we are in a preparatory deal from, I think, from five. Uh, and you can even uh, can go back to 12. But I think we're in a preparatory. And, and uh, mortify, therefore, your members. Um, and then he tells you, uh, in 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on children of disobedience. So to me, he's expounding some things. He's telling you, explaining, uh, if you are this, why you should be doing that. And that's why I say the greatest Christian exercise is simply the renouncing of those things that God tells you, kill this off in your life. Take care of these things. Because if you don't, there's going to be judgment coming on the wrath of God. And so... Uh, I'm not telling you that when you get to heaven, God's going to say, well, you're not saved now. You've lost your salvation. I'm not going to tell you that. What I am going to tell you is on this earth, you can build a wall between you and God. And that wall is going to make it hard for you to hear him. And it's, it's not because of what God has done. It's because of what we have done. Um, so, I think there's three views possible. And one of them is simply that um, uh, if you go down to verse 7, it says, In which ye also, we'll hit this in a minute, which also, uh, in which ye also walked sometime when you lived in them. He's, uh, he's, it's a reminder. You had an old life. The key there is old. You also have a new life. And we need to live the new life and not the old life. And so that's why they tell us we need to mortify our members. So, Again, I believe this is a, an idea of construction, uh, instruction for the believers. Now, are you at war? Let me just ask you. Are you at war, yes or no? Are you actually participating in that war? That's, the next, that's something only you know. Are you participating in war? Yeah, we are at war. And, and where is that war at? It's in two realms. Uh, if you go into 1 Peter 2.11, I think the first war, um, I would say, is in the physical body. It talks about mortify your members in five. It's a war against our members. And 1 Peter 2.11 says this, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from flesh and lust, which war against the soul. So we are definitely in a war, in a physical war. Uh, and, and you can see, and I guess we can go to them, uh, 1 Corinthians 9.27. 1 Corinthians 9.27. And the Bible says, But I keep under my body and bring it, in, it into subjection. I keep. There's a war there again. He has to keep his body. It doesn't willingly obey. He has to bring it into subjection. It has a will of its own. It is the flesh. It has its own desires. It is in corruption. He said, least by any means when I have, by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. There's a lot of preachers today who are not living the life they need to live. There's a lot of people who claim to be Christians who are not living the life they need to live. Some people are examples. Some people are just among the crowd. But every one of us has an impact for the things of God. We need to live for Him. And then we have a 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. And you want to look in verses 5 and 6. This is how we bring our body, body into subjection. It says, uh, Casting down imagination every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Your flesh will exalt itself against the knowledge of God. It wants to do what it wants to do. And it says, uh, and bring, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Six, and having in a, in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. It's like I said, it is a war. Uh, you could look actually in, in verse five here when it talks about mortify. That's again, that's a battle. It's all about a war we need to win. And we can't win the war. We can't be in the relationship we need with God. We can't please God. We can't do any of those things if ye then be risen in Christ. If you're not seeking and setting your heart on these affections, 
If you're not doing that, you're seeking and setting your heart on the affections of this world. I, I mean, it's two different directions. You've got to determine which one you're going. So the second is, uh, for believers, is a spiritual war. And I go in, and I look in Ephesians 6. I think it's 12. Well, actually, if you go back, and, and this would be applicable, it says, uh, Finally, my brethren, 610, and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then 12, it tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. These are powers we have no ability to defeat in and of ourselves. This is through the power of God we have this uh, ability to have uh, this, uh, what do I say, victory. This war is never won in the power of the flesh, but in spite of the flesh, by the power of the Spirit. Uh, so go ahead, let's go on to 7. 3, 7 says, In which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. Paul here is making an acknowledgement that uh, as men we have all walked after the flesh. You know, some people are saved very early in life, you know, four and five and six. Um, uh, I never had an inkling back then. You know, it was, it was later in life before I really understood uh, everything. I, I do think because I was brought through the plan of salvation when I was about eight or nine, maybe ten, I had a better understanding of what I needed to do when I come under conviction. And I was able to, um, to go to the Lord understanding what I needed to do. But here uh, we have Paul acknowledging that even he has walked after the flesh, I believe. I don't, I don't think he's denying that, but in this he says, ye also walk sometime. Now what we do is we, uh, we are Christian now, and we've grown a little bit, and so we, down, we look down at other people that are in sin. Oh, you know, those homeless people or those, these people or these people, whatever they're doing, and we look down. When we should be saying, by the grace of God, there go I. Because it's only by the grace of God, and it's by his mercies that we are saved. I think Titus 3.5 is very clear on that. Um, uh, but he, again, we point out the fact that once in Christ, there's no need to continue in sin. He said, in which ye also walked some time. When you lived in them, when you lived in that shape, when you lived uh, like the world, before Christ, I would assume here, um, but you don't have to now. After salvation, you, you should walk in the Spirit. But the fact is, you're going to have to choose. Every day is full of choices. You know when it's really difficult to make the right choice? When it just suddenly happens. I remember there was an illustration. A man uh, was preaching and he took a, a pitcher and he poured himself a glass of water and he drank a little bit. And then he stuck the pitcher back under the pulpit, set the cup down. He got to talking a bit and he picked up that pitcher again and got to walking around and act like he tripped. And when he did, he flung it. Well, it wasn't water. It was confetti. But everybody thought it was water. And he made the statement. He says, it's not what you can deliberately pour out but what comes out when you trip. Because the real you comes out, what's really in the heart. I never forgot that illustration because it, it, it made a point to me. We need to be sure that what's in here is the same thing that we're trying to pour out. We need to be sure that we're not heretics. No, I wouldn't call it heretics. Hypocrites, that's the word. I knew it started with an H. I'm so thankful my wife is smart. She helps me look good. So not only will you choose, choose, need to choose to walk, but you'll also need to choose not to allow the flesh to ever control you. These, these, all these are choices. You choice. You know what I call this? I often say, what will you will to will? What, is, what, what are you willing to will in your life? I will do this. I will do that. I will allow my flesh to influence. I'll allow my flesh to control. It's all about the will. And you have to determine which way you're going to go. It's a choice. Are you going to choose to follow God? Is that your will? Or are you just like, well, I won't use Smurfs, but you understand. You're just kind of walking along and, and everything's fine to you. You don't worry about it. You have to determine here in your mind. I like what the Marine said. I've used it before. I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's, it's something like the idea that every battle is won in the mind first. I believe that. 
You know, I can I I remember a a, a, man, a young man. I was in um third third grade, and um we were in a conversation. I think we was having to do something together. There's about three or four of us, and he made this. I, I, he made a statement about doing something. I said I can't do that. My parents would never allow it. I said they would they would not uh, be open to that at all. He said your parents can't make you do anything. Oh, they can't. They can say they can beat me. They can do anything they want, but I can do what I want. Nobody can control that. Worst thing could ever happen to me at that age. Because at that point, that thing sunk in and I started doing what I wanted. And it did cost me. My parents were very diligent to make sure it cost me. But that proves the point. It, you, have to be, you have to determine your mind. There has to be a diligence. I'm going to do, no matter what happens, the will of God. Will there be, will there be uh, resistance? Will the world be against you? Will there be friends that, uh, yeah, when the moment I got saved, I lost every friend I had makes you question the, the definition of friendship if I had back then. But anyway, um, uh, we need to determine that we're going to look to God. Now, you know, I was thinking about this. How many of you know my car situation right now? Okay, a few of you. We don't have a car right now. It tore up. So <clears throat> we don't have any money neither. So um, I'm thinking about this thing. Hey, uh, let me, let me, before I go on, let me just say this. I told Vera, it's a real funny thing, because the moment that car tore up, I said, and we were home without a car, I never had so much peace in my life. I said, I can't go anywhere, I can't do anything, I just might as well praise the Lord and, you know, go, go about. I mean, I, I was like, I was on vacation for two days. It didn't have a, it really felt good, you know. I was like, I've never been this relaxed in years. And so, you know, but, um, uh, I've been telling you that, you know, I don't worry about finances. I don't worry about this. I don't worry about that. And God says, okay, now prove it to them. <laughs> That's fine, you know. God's going to work it out. I already see his hand working in some things. I'm, I'm trusting him. And I've got Vera on my side. She's trusting me as I trust him. No, she's trusting him too. We both have peace about this. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the future holds. But I do know who holds the future. <clears throat> and I think that's the key. What's going to happen? I got a perfect way to look at this. Let's wait and see. I believe God's working. I've been telling Beer for about a year we need a new vehicle. I just didn't expect Monday to be today. Anyway, <clears throat> I love the idea of look and live. Just look to God. Just trust Him. Um, so this was a, a. This was actually. A, if you look through this and study this, you'll find that. Um, it was a practice of Paul that a lot of, of, of uh, critics believed him wrong in. And, it, and what he believed was those in sin uh, need to change immediately. These people here, they need to change. He wasn't saying, well, you need to, you need to work on this, work on this, work on this. He said, you need to change. Mortify your members. Lie not to one another. Put off these, the old man. You understand, he, he was, that's, if you're really a Christian... There's some things you need to do, and, and he wasn't giving them any room. It was, you need to do these things. And a lot of people say, well, you know, they need to have time. And that's what his critics really were basically saying. They were saying, you know, uh, these people are just babes in Christ, and, and they don't really know what they need to do. They need time to adjust, or they need a, pre, uh, 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 a period of probation before coming to part of the church. And to be honest with you, we do that overseas. We would always, and especially if you had Muslims, you wanted to give them an opportunity um, to, to adjust to it and to give them uh, before they joined the church. I always waited a length of time before I was even interested in it. I still do that today, but Paul was not that way. Paul was saying, okay, you're in Christ. Why, why are you doing this? This is no business. Uh, is he right or wrong? Everybody's real quiet. That means only one person has enough courage to voice his opinion, and the rest of you, okay? Here's the truth. Flat out. Do you have Christ in you? Then there should be an instantaneous change. Okay? Will you get it all right? No. No. But the moment Christ 
come into your life. The moment you accept him as Savior, that was an instantaneous change. You now have the indwelling Holy Spirit. You can never go back to what you were before. You can act like it, but you will always be a new creature in Christ. Your growth and everything else is dependent upon you accepting that and then applying yourself. Uh, you know, it's like going to college. When I went to college, I didn't like wearing ties. I didn't like doing a lot. I didn't like the scheduling. I was probably a little bit more spontaneous at that time. But I was, I was getting onto the schedule idea, but I was still a little spontaneous. But I had to adhere. You have to be at this time. You have to be dressed this way. And I'm thinking... No, I'm, I wasn't an old man back then, but I kept saying, I look at these 18-year-olds and I think, I'm an old man compared to this, and i got to do all this. I should have an exception. No, there was no exception. I had to do it, and I had to comply, which was good, because that conform, being conformed to that image, I became transformed. Well, can I politely say this? When you start off your Christian life, you need to be willing to be obedient and be conformed to the Word of God. There is a transformation in here, but it takes a while for that transportation, trans, transformation to come out. Some of us, uh, or some people, or as very quickly, others are slow. It depends on the baggage they've had, but there is no excuse. Now, I do believe what Paul was saying is, and the critics were against, I think the critics more or less wanted them to have a little bit of liberty um, and not, 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 not the liberty they should have had. But he was wanting to have a little bit of liberty and, and Paul wanted them to immediately step in and begin the Christian life. Now let me ask you this. When, when did you become a soldier of the cross? Say again. The moment you're saved. What happened? You know, I was in the military. Anybody else in here was in the military? Okay. You know what happens in the military? You go into this recruiter, and he signs you. You sign up. You sign a piece of paper, and he says you need to report here. On let's say let's just use uh, January first. At this office. So you get to that office, and the first thing they do is they put you on a bus, and they ship you off to wherever boot camp is. And then boot camp, first thing they do, they line you up in front of that bus and start yelling at you. I mean, they just, they're trying to, it's a mental game. And then they march you into a little room with chairs, and they cut all your hair off. I don't care how long your hair was, when you leave there, it was even shorter. <clears throat> it's all a mental game. So when did I become a soldier? I become a soldier the minute I signed that paper. I just didn't know it yet. You know, it took it took me uh, just a little while to recognize it on that date, but yeah. And so you may be saved, and you may not realize you're a soldier, but you're a soldier, and you need to start applying your life, uh, choosing to making the right choices. Um, you're already the moment you're at, into the body of Christ. You're already a part, the moment you're saved. You're already a part of the body of Christ, and we need to begin the process of putting off. Some people don't have the they don't have the, the, the older believers around or a good church around to tell them all this stuff. Uh, but you need to put, start putting this off. I remember in our, when our situation, when I got saved, was going to church. and um, They taught us, first thing they taught us is that you could lose your salvation. When I asked the pastor, I said, how do you know you've lost your salvation? Because I always thought when they tell me things, I'd think. He said, oh, don't worry about it, you'll know. That's not an answer I wanted. Not at all. Um, my studies tell me you cannot lose it. Uh, you know, I do see the hardness of putting off the old man. It's, it's nothing easy. Uh, how many of us have completed the process of putting off the old man? How many of you are expecting to do it anytime soon? How many of you want to do it anytime soon? <laughs> I hope all of us want to, but no, we won't. This life is going to always be that. We're always going to struggle with it. He says here, he says, in which ye also walked in them. I think he's referring to there was a time when they were totally given over to it. Now you need to clean up. You lived in those things. Now you need to live in Christ. He, he says it back here when he says, hid with Christ in God. Now you need to live with Christ. You need to be in God. You need to begin to act like that. 
So Paul looked at new believers differently. He, he wanted them to take sin seriously. Um, I wrote this down. And I wrote this uh, earlier. It says, For as long as the old man, old man still has liberty in a person's life, the new man, Christ, does not have liberty in that life. Think about that. If you're giving yourself the liberty to do the things you used to do and live the way you used to live, you're giving this, this, that sinful old life liberty, where is the liberty that Christ can have to grow you and make you more the child of God. You understand what I'm saying? You, you hinder the growth of the Spirit. Um, <clears throat> it takes time to put off old habits. Would you agree with that? So what do we do? We just give up? Did somebody say yes? I hope not. I just heard. I said no. Okay, that's good. So it does. It does take time uh, to put off the the old man. It takes it takes diligence. It takes understanding. There's going to be failures. It, it takes a while. Um, but in the process, there has to be signs. What do I mean by signs? Magical, mystical stuff. Is that what I mean? What do I mean? fruit some kind of fruit maybe only one pear on the tree <laughs> you understand it may not be a lot but there's got to be fruit and that's what we're looking for <clears throat> I don't think Paul was looking for any magical change I don't think Paul was looking for this uh, great uh, big uh, change in these people's lives but I tell you what I do think because of the way chapter 3 is written he says if ye then be risen Wait a minute. What I'm seeing here doesn't really add up to the length of time that you've been in Christ and the fruit I'm supposed to be seeing. And so I'm going to give you some instruction to help you. So I think when I see that if ye, it's questionable. There's something isn't happening. He's not seeing something in their life. He's looking for that new man. The Holy Spirit is going to begin to manifest in a believer's life. Uh, uh, if you are going to seek after Christ, Second uh, Corinth uh, Chronicles uh, seven fourteen, is, uh, and I'm not going to quote the whole verse. Yeah, but I want to want to just use one part of that. Will seek my face. Define that. See, we know the words. A lot of times, you know, we know what G-O-D is. Oh, that's God. Well, what is God? Is it just G-O-D? I've said this before. He's more than G-O-D. Seek my face. We understand what that says, but we can't define it. We know the words. But what does it mean to seek my face? If my people which are called by my name, right? What do you mean by Revelation. I don't, I, don't, I don't mean personal as in unique I, to you, but personal. I understand what you're saying. I don't have any problem with that. I think that's a, a pretty good definition, uh, a personal. And I wouldn't, knowing how you define that, I wouldn't mind you saying a personal revelation of God in my life. In other words, I need to meet with God. I need to see Him. I need to understand some things about it. Basically, I need to know Him. If you're going to seek His face, the idea is you're going to look, want to be able to look at Him and, and identify him and understand him, which we're limited in. So I, I go right along with what you're saying. I think we do. Um, I, I, I do a little bit. Of, I'm not reading a lot right now. I'm just doing a little bit. But um, how many of us come to church expecting to see God? Okay, let me put that another way. How many of us come to church with our minds ready to worship. I, I would imagine very few. We get up in the morning. We, we spilled my coffee. I'm mad now. Got to clean up. 
Or maybe we get in the car and, and, and Vera's just, or maybe I'm probably more me. But you understand, so you're all, and then you, in church. You understand what I'm saying? Does it happen? And then everybody look at Bruce? No. <laughs> but you understand, it does happen. We are human. I think a lot of times people don't even think about coming to church and worshiping God. You know, how many times do we come in here dressed with our mindset that this, this is a holy place? When I set this thing up in the morning, to me, this is a holy place. I spent time in the Word of God studying. I am prepared to preach. I pray before I preach, asking God not to allow my uh, mind and my body to, to interfere with it, to that he would control me. And so for me, when I step up here, I'm thinking, Lord, I want you to be ever in front of these people. I don't want them to see me. I want them to see you. To me, it's a time that I can um, uh, uh, give out what God has given me. And so when I come here, I'm praying your minds are ready to worship. You're ready to see God. Remember what I told you the theme that, that God gave me when we started here, what it was? that they might know him. That's the whole purpose. That we come and worship that we might know him. To seek his face. I want to seek his face that I might know him and him alone. This is a sacred place. Oh, it's the seniors hall. It's, no, it's not. Anytime we come to a place where we're going to preach and teach about God, it becomes sacred. You never, the way you approach it um, it may not be sacred to you, but it's sacred to me. And so anyway, I'm rambling now. If you go seek to grow in Christ, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. First of all, you need to seek to accept the responsibility for your old life. You need to accept, okay, I had an old life, I had a lot of sins in there, but this, from this day forward, it's a new life in Christ. He's given me the opportunity not to wipe the slate clean, but to place it under the blood of Jesus Christ and begin again anew. And so that's, I'm responsible for what I did, but now I'm seeking to grow in Christ, to become a new man, to become the individual uh, God would be happy, would be pleased with my life. And so there has to be signs of a new life where that person is not applying themselves. Um, again, it doesn't have to be drastic change, but you're looking for change. Um, What are some ways that uh, the new man is manifested in life? You know, a person that you knew got saved, uh, began to read the Bible, began to go to church. You knew the old man. So what ways would you be looking at to see the manifestation of the new man? change of heart. Yes. Who? Go ahead. Maybe, uh, maybe they, they don't swear as much. <laughs> yeah. Sir? The way we treat others. The way we treat others. We hear the good news. Sharing the, sharing the good news. Sharing, yeah, yeah. Testifying of what God's done for you. Yes. Um, that, for me, was one of the harder ones. It really was, telling others what God had done. Um, because I had a fairly rough life, and I was still a little backward a little bit. But, you know, I've told you before, when I first got tracks, I would lay them places. Go to the bathroom, one in the bathroom. Go by this, put one there. And then it got so, you know, you give one, and you're, you're ready to run. And you know how they was going to react. And so, and, and now it's, it's, it's nothing. So that's a progression. I can look back, for me personally, I can look back in my sermons. When six years ago, ten years ago, I wrote sermons. I look at them now and I kind of blush. I'm like, really? I'm embarrassed I even wrote that. Um, because I can see my growth in those. And I hold everything. I keep them. Uh, I just want to share about my father's experience when he got saved. That he preached the gospel that he experienced. Even though he's not a pastor, Amen. He, his friends and his colleagues would say, you're crazy. You were a drunkard, and all of a sudden you're preaching the word of God. There was a change. Yes, a very drastic change for him. 
and you know, people will say that in, initially. Um, I had a friend of mine who had gotten in trouble with his wife, and so she said he had to go to church. So he thought that's what it was in my life. He said, you did something wrong, and she's caught you. Now you have to go to church. What are you going to tell him? You know, I just, you know what I told him? Here's what, here was my answer. Watch and see. Okay? Because I've never been the same since then. Watch and see. And so I knew by what God was doing in my life, there's going to be changes. Some people, the change is instantaneously. Some, it takes a little longer. Some even longer still. But there's going to be changes. And so I thought what she said was a heart change. A heart change, a lot of times you don't see instantaneously. But a person cursing and how they deal with others. Those things, you know, for me it was drinking and smoking and drugs. Those were going immediately. Um, it was probably my third year better in Bible college where I got rid of the cursing because I would get so mad. Boom. You know, I just, it just popped. So now it's, it, I tell people um, I've not lost my temper. I know exactly where it's at, but I try to keep it tamped down. Yes, sir. Um, there was one man, actually the grandfather of my pastor in Kansas. He got saved a bit later in life. I believe his wife and some of his kids got saved before he did. Mm. But anyway, he, he got saved and he went to work and in the shop. I, guess, I think he burned himself or something. And everybody in the shop waited around. And then finally one of the guys said, well, aren't you going to curse? Yeah, yeah. Because you're expecting that old man. Yeah, they're expecting the old man to come out. Did somebody else have their hand up? No. But yeah. Um, I look, you know, if for me, cursing, I think God takes away from people what they can't handle. Smoking was very difficult for me. The drinking was difficult. And so God took all that instantaneously. I didn't even know the day I quit. It was a week later before I figured it out. But the cursing, that was, that was, I still have to be careful to this very day of certain words because they form wrong in the mouth and the other ones can come out. So I had to be very careful. So it was a very trying time. But he takes what you can't handle. He leaves what you can so you can grow. If you're saved and, and you have a besetting sin, uh, God may take it from you, but he may not. He may leave it with you that you can struggle through it. But you can have victory, but it's going to be through him. So anyway, um, anybody else want to add anything? I'm going to, um, I'm going to close it right here. Um, all right, then we'll shut it down. I've went too long already. Um,